In 1945, we thought, oh, at last, peace and prosperity, and everybody was working, and things were going up, and all of a sudden we started choking on what we were doing. Noble have I created thee, why dost thou abase thyself? Our destiny is noble indeed. Many people say if it could only be as it was when we were children, when things were simple, why can't it be as it was? And I was thinking, it can't be because all the people living in those old houses have changed. Maybe the houses haven't changed, but the people have changed. And the times have changed. And there is no going back anymore. of this conversation is to talk about the progress that we've seen in the 25 years in the advancement of women and gender equality. At a time when we are commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference in 1995. The UN has done what it does best, which is to help surface and raise the visibility of this issue, but it hasn't been able to do what governments and the culture has to do. Mm -hmm. I think what we are learning within Baha'i communities is that we have to be investing in building strong, resilient communities at the local level because that is where the lasting change, the sustained change is going to happen. We have a goal on gender equality, the Sustainable Development Goals, that also accepts and says very clearly that even though it's a standalone goal, it cross-cuts with every single other goal. And we shouldn't take it for granted or assume that this was kind of natural. It took tremendous effort. An open letter to the women of the world from the women delegates and advisors at the first assembly of the United Nations. We call on the governments of the world to encourage women everywhere to take a more active part in national and international affairs. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We have learned valuable lessons in the past five years. The attitudinal prejudices which stand in the way of women's advancement are held by women as well as by men. Time is short for us to rectify the present unsustainable patterns. We must achieve greater equality. We have proposed an Equal Rights Amendment. Those delegations who are in favor of Draft Resolution 1, entitled The Role of Women in the Preparation of Societies for Life and Peace, raise their hands, please. The women's movement is about changes in a society, about changes that are global. We want this to be remembered as a conference of women, by women, and for women. I declare open the 41st session of the Commission on the Status of Women. We have to give real meaning to the ideals of women's equality. This has been a century of women's emancipation. Beijing was something we all shared. Today, we all own the great responsibility of implementing the platform for action. The first 63 years have been momentous. Today, let us be clear about what needs to change. So the World Conference on Women in Beijing 
1995 was like a springboard for many women and many organizations that were working on women's rights to help us see that uh, women's rights and women's advancement is not a Western feminist idea, but it is very much in their culture. I was born in Malaysia. My father came from China as a school teacher. My mother was a local born, a Peranakan as they call it. And like many women of that time, my grandmother had bound feet. Hers was about six inches. Now, the mother had bound her feet when she was an infant. And um, the beauty was described as a, a woman with a three inch feet walking and swaying like a weeping willow. So she suffered a lot from the binding of her feet that deformed her feet. To walk is really very painful. It took a lot of courage of my grandmother not to bind the feet of my mother. And because of that, it liberated me from this tradition of bound feet. This yeah. is Beijing. Oh, it's Beijing. That's, that's Beijing. That's Ros Harris. Yeah. And Virginia. Wow. Oh. Which one's you, Mary? I'm not seeing you. Anymore. Here, you won't believe it, but that's. Oh, that's yeah. you. That's right. I remember yeah. your suit. Yeah. Yeah, that's Mary. Yeah. That's right. Oh yeah. my gosh. Uh, there's a long history of the bi-international community with the United Nations and uh, for a long time it was one person who carried the burden or however you want to look at it and that was Mildred Matajeta and she certainly was a mentor out there for all of us to, mm -hmm. on the international level. That period of time uh, was ending uh, just as I came in, really. So Mary will remember that when I came to the UN and she was the representative, we used to have many different agencies at the UN that were responsible for gender equality. It was all over the place and there was no unity. When uh, the Commission on the Status of Women was meeting, it so happened that I was the chair of the NGO Committee on the mm. Status of Women. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like Mary had been <laughs> 10 years mm -hmm. before that. And so we decided to send a letter to the Secretary General Kofi Annan. And finally, in 2010, a resolution was passed that created UN Women. That's so nice, because also 25 years after, yeah. after Beijing, um, now at the United Nations, they're thinking about all of the different ways of advancing this. So they're working at the grassroots level, they're also working at the national level with their governments, they're here at the international level. And we see that gender equality today is very much at the forefront of the public mind. And what's really nice is that young people are thinking about all of the different ways of advancing this. And we're seeing that happen around the world, which is really exciting. My father, he did not want his daughter to go out. 
for people to see her outside. There was also the question of cost, because there is a lot of difference between upper caste and lower caste families. And while I was from an upper caste family, the man I wanted to marry was from a different caste. He lived in the village, and his background, his way of living, was very different from mine. However, my only wish was that I could live there and would be able to serve the community the way I wished to, because my husband would give me equal rights and I would be able to move forward with him at the same pace, side by side. But when we went to different places to serve, many people made fun of us. For example, when we used to come back late at night, my husband would help me wash clothes together or sweep the house while I was doing other work. The people of the village used to laugh at us, would talk behind our backs about our actions. But slowly over the years, I saw some things change. One day, I was sitting outside my house and I noticed one of my neighbors pick up a broom and start sweeping his house. I started to laugh. He asked me, why are you laughing? Your husband also sweeps the house. I thought, maybe a transformation is taking place and I'm happy you're doing this. We could see now for parents, they really believe that in terms of, for example, preparing food, they really believe that it is the women who can only do that. If they are going together in the field, they, the husband will only carry an axe around. But to find that the woman is carrying half buckets on her head with cassava, including vegetables, the husband will not help. You cannot come near to a, a woman who is preparing food. It was not allowed at first. So even these boys and girls who have been growing, they could see that difference. The husband would just come and shout at the woman to say, why are you not cleaning the house? Why are you not preparing food at this time? But him is just sitting like this, waiting for a woman. A woman who come from very far from the farm, she's very tired, she puts there and then start touch other things, she does this and this, and then she gives first food to the men. Her, she will eat at last. But now men, they have come to see that this barrier that we created to see that this is for women, this is for men, it is really pulling us down. We cannot grow. We recently became parents. Our daughter is almost a year and a half. So that really brought in a whole new element of what housework looks like if you're striving for gender equality, what income looks like if you're striving for gender equality, what childcare looks like. For us, gender equality doesn't mean sameness. So it doesn't mean that like we necessarily do the same tasks the same amount, but somewhere in there, there's a balance. I think the biggest barrier remains to be expectation of what is equality mean and how do we as a couple and how do we as a family really address that expectation and and when it's correct, apply it correctly and when it leaves much to be desired, how can we alter that in how we live our lives? But I think it's one of the things we've discussed a lot where Kimmy is very driven in her career and as am I. So we say, well, how can we um, both succeed out there in the world as well as at home with equal voices in our marriage. Our daughter has so much joy, like I think even more than the average baby, maybe I'm biased, <laughs> but she just like screams with delight all of the time. And you see how women in this world are, are barraged with so many things and so many challenges. And so I know these challenges will come her way. For her to keep that bit of joy for herself is gonna, going to require, I think, resilience to all these challenges that come and just you know, having the tools to, to take the world for what it is and, and make it a better place, but retain that part of herself that, that is so valuable to me and so valuable to, to many others, I think. One of the things that I think we both think about a lot in raising Rumi, our son, is cultivating his gentleness and giving him the space to be who he is. He it has this boldness and he has this courage and he has this energy. 
Um, and he has all these things that I know people are going to like love and encourage about him because he's a boy, but he's also, he's full of gentleness and thoughtfulness and compassion. He's so observant. He sits in silence beautifully. He is like, creative and collaborative. He loves beautiful things. And those are like these attributes that are just as beautiful about him. And I don't want any one thing to mean that he can't be the other thing. As a Baha'i, understanding the unity of the world uh, is, is something that, that we really hold dear. And raising Rumi is one of the things that I think I do as a member of the human race. Starting a family really feels like we're beginning to participate in a, in a dialogue that, that exists across the entire world. It's not something that exists in America or something that exists in Asia. It's something that we all do together. Nosotros como we as a family always consult. We always consult. So even though they are very young, there are issues that we consult about together that are at their level of understanding. A quote that inspires me and that I love is the one that says that the two wings of a bird are like the man and the woman. And when the two come together, the bird can fly with strength. And an example I give is that of my brother, who when I do a job, he helps me. And this way, we can progress together. Well, it's important because, like, if I let my sister do all the chores alone, she's going to finish, but she has to do other things. She can't be doing house chores all the time as if she was working here. When I got married in 2008, those days, newlywed brides were not allowed to go out of the house. I used to run a school, so two or three days after the wedding, we went to my school so that she could start teaching children. But all of the villagers went against me for doing this, saying she is a newlywed bride and that I cannot take her out like this. They told me all sorts of things, but I ignored them. Every parent wishes that their children take the right path in life. Even I hope that my three daughters take the right path in life and contribute to the construction of a better society. This is my wish. When we focus on their moral and spiritual education right from a young age, they stand out and contribute in transforming this society, this world, in a better way. Men have to be able to contribute, and to say that it's women's issue kind of infers that men can't contribute to their betterment. But as men are often referred to, I think they must be referred to as potential contributors. And we certainly know the problems that have been caused by patriarchy. But there are men willing and ready right now to contribute in a meaningful and appropriate way to the advancement of women. I think part of what allows toxic masculinity to flourish is, it, is actually the suppression of, of, of what might be true masculinity, you know, which is not the expression we've seen. You know, we see something that's contorted. I mean, cartoons, the sort of things that we expose our, our youngest people to. Um, are full of, even just, I think, visually, these, these certain ideals, you know, a, a, a man with an extreme V, <laughs> broad shoulder, you know, he's, he's good for a few things. 
and a woman who's shaped like an hourglass who's also good for a few things. So we actually start force feeding our, our youngest, um, our children, our babies, like tropes more or less. And what does a spiritual perspective allow us to consider then? You know, if, 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 not that we discard the material, but we include the spiritual. So together, what kind of perspective might we have of a man, you know? Well, first, I mean, I think it's safe to say that, that we, we're, we're still exploring what healthy masculinity is. The same way that women have been oppressed, that means a co-relative suppression of what it means to be masculine. Our, our, uh, our male-dominated structures are maybe of the latter kind. They are, they are too rigid, they're calcified, they're, they're, they're hard and therefore they will break. But, but what kind of strength is it to be elastic, to bend, to be receptive? You know, this reconceptualization of, of man and woman is also the reconceptualization of society. I'm not sure exactly what principles boys need to learn at an early age to be proponents of gender equality, but I know it needs to be learned as early as possible. And the thing is, is that it can't be just one segment of their lives. You can't have their parents teaching them about gender equality and then their grandparents don't. You can't have them learning gender equality at home and then when they go to, out into community activities where gender equality is in practice. So the entire community has to contribute to that. And that means that everyone has to be on board, every single person that that child, that, that boy runs into has to enforce this ideal and that makes the change generational. Twenty-five years ago, more or less at the time when I began to work in education, parents would say that to study was not important. I remember once a gentleman arrived in the community and I tried to convince him to let his daughter go to school. And the gentleman said, I have animals, I have land, and if my daughter is going to study, if what she is going to learn is to write letters to her boyfriend, then I don't want to. Within the challenges that exist is that education should reach all communities. But a quality education, a holistic education that thinks of people as whole beings, a whole human being that is composed of three natures, the physical one, his or her body should eat well and be well nourished and have a dignified life, the intellectual part, his or her capacity. Human beings have many capacities and how they develop those capacities through education, but they also have a spiritual part. Through that spiritual part, they can show that they are kind, honest, and truthful, and that is what we need. And if it is received in that holistic way, we can do many things, achieve great things. But the setback in the communities and culture is sometimes because the person is intellectually trained but is not prepared to make a good decision, to be fair with what he does, to be equitable, to be kind then that is the part that is really needed. The spiritual education of children is very useful. If a children starts attending these spiritual classes, these Baha'i children's classes, then it's like when you plant a new tree. When it becomes big, it will provide fruits, shade and wood. But if when it was small we didn't give it enough water, so spiritual education is like that small plant that if we water it with spiritual qualities, then it will be beneficial for their future, to its parents and to their community. They will grow and then emerge as a beneficial resource for the community. 
बहुत ही अच्छे तरीके से निखर कर आएगा और अपने समुदाय को बेहतर बनाने में वो काफ़ी लाभकारी साबित होगा We study while seated in a circle to show that no one is superior to the other. We just study together. If you miss a point, others will help you because we are all learning like everyone else. In our study, we learn a lot of things. We learn about confirmation, justice, respect, and many others. The relationship between the animator and the junior youth is that the animator needs to be a responsible and well-informed person so he can effectively assist the junior youth. Therefore, at this stage in life, the junior youth needs someone older than them to help guide them in their lives. The junior youth study a number of texts which discuss a number of spiritual qualities such as being generous, loving each other and other spiritual qualities. And what is helping them to recognize positive and negative forces in their community. Before in the past years, it was difficult for women to be free around men. It appeared that men were always in the forefront, implying that the women are behind, making it difficult for women who had thoughts to share. Some texts discuss qualities such as perseverance. If they see challenges in their communities, but they do not have the quality of perseverance, they will feel hopeless to face these challenges. But if they understand well the concept of perseverance and patience, they will be confident that with time, they will end these challenges the community is facing. I think with regard to the, the impact of the, the junior youth program on the families of the junior youth, I think one element that we've observed basically in our community is everyone is participating. I, I think to me that already is sending a signal to the family to say the same task that a boy can perform also a girl can perform. Because when you are doing the services, we don't like separate this kind of work is for the girls or this kind of service is for boys, but they do together. So you could find that when we are carrying out these services, it was raising some questions from the parents in the community and then trying to ask what is happening. Even the, when they, they get back to their homes, they are also taking those things which we are doing at the group level to their families. Previously, according to our community culture and practices, men didn't really have trust in the capacity of the women in terms of their ability to contribute to opinions and knowledge. But gradually, women have shown their capacity and are now known as equal to men. Men are also gaining trust towards women.
As village leaders, we have many responsibilities and are not only concerned with the education and religion of the villagers, but we are also concerned with the empowerment of women. Women are regarded as an important component of the community. This village will not develop further without women. Women help us to reach higher nobility. For me, I understand that the sort of context of the divine doesn't exist within this this binary of men and women, but it's something that really, it's something that surpasses that. It's something that goes beyond what we can understand of this physical world. I really see my own faith as being something that helps me understand qualities of compassion and justice and equity and equality. At the United Nations and, and many governments, um, around the world are thinking about material markers to help us identify where we've made progress and where there are gaps in, in the status of women around the world. At the same time, the proliferation of inequality, of oppression, um, of injustice in, in any way, and, and, and in this sense against women, is very obviously a spiritual problem, but it has expression in our material systems because we live in a material world. So the structures of society inevitably reflect our values, but our values are spiritual. So to only have material meters and markers is in a way to hamstring where we're able to succeed or what we're able to accomplish. When you look at the power structures of religious practices uh, over the course of, of, the, of millennia, they really have done a very good job at sidelining the voice of women and promoting the, the voice of men in those power structures. And I think that's something that we have to look at objectively and atone for because it has inhibited religion itself's ability to, to achieve what it is meant to achieve for all of humanity. But again, that's just the practice of religion. I also think that the history of religion is a history of trying to understand the world around us through a spiritual dimension. And it has always tried to confront the new challenges before humanity. And just like uh, in, in you know, decades and centuries gone by, those religious leaders who are willing to embrace it and question it and learn about it are, are going to be pointing humanity, I think, in, in a wonderful uh, direction. In many traditions and culture, as well as religion, Women do not lead press. Women are not allowed to say press at certain periods of the month. Women are not considered fit to be the one that can uh, hold the holy books or touch the holy books. Right? But the Baha'i devotional meeting changed all that. That everyone was equal, even a girl child, could say press could be the one to lead the press, could be the one to uh, have people unite together in one voice. So Baha'i devotional is a way of us seeing ourselves as um, individuals that have a spiritual side, and this spirit can be connected irrespective of what is our outer differences. Slowly, we started having devotional meetings. We started inviting people from different localities in these devotional meetings. There were many questions as to why God has created us all in the same manner, or why does God love us all, and in His sight, no one is high or low. We study documents about health, documents on unity in society, how to love each other, 
After reading, then everybody gives a suggestion on how things can be organized, what change can be brought, what can be done in the family, how our children can progress, how to stay away from bad habits. Some of the women are shy and do not talk, but slowly they have started talking and understood their responsibilities and how to put it into action. कुछ महिलाएं बहुत संकोच करती हैं नहीं बोलती हैं लेकिन अब वो धीरे-धीरे बोलने लगी हैं और उस चीज को अपने दायित्व को समझने लगी हैं कि हम किस तरह से उस कार्य को करें From what I've seen, when places try to apply these qualities of, of justice and equality, oftentimes the results fall short because what they're trying to do are create masks on material structure. But what really needs to happen is, is an entire transformation of that sort of level of the soul. So when we have this, a conviction from a spiritual place that all people are equal, all people have this inherent nobility, all people have limitless spiritual capacity, then the way that we can push forward becomes so much stronger. People who live in totally different conditions with totally different backgrounds to really come together as a collective and share how despite this variety, we still can learn from one another, we still can pick things up from one another's experiences in these really special ways. Really, it was just the beginning when I was at the UN. We made a statement on the importance of the girl child and the importance of educating the girl child. To the Commission on the Status of Women in 1974, and uh, there was really not a lot of reaction to it at that time. However, when I was in Beijing for the Fourth World Conference, it became part of the program of action. That was another step forward. It was really a thrilling moment. It was, it was the influencing the process to the ultimate. And the director of the Office for the Advancement of Women at the UN came up to me and we high five. <laughs> it was really a victory. It took time. Everything takes time. It's process, process, process. Yes. But it was a wonderful moment. I've been thinking a lot about how important it is for the work that the UN does in keeping world peace. And one thing that I want to link back to what governments can do more for the education of girls is to safeguard this peace. Peace is so fragile in this day and age, and education is so dependent on peace to persist. Gender equity requires the culture of peace for us to have a sustainable future. What are the desirable and urgently needed dynamics and traits and qualities that we want to see in the world and how do they begin to play that role in a way that is both bold and humble and open and informed. So I think in education we have this rich opportunity to, to engage our imagination um, and to think very carefully about what is the world that we're building and how are we giving the tools spiritually and intellectually to our young people to come to the forefront and to play that role. So this has been really a road of 25 years. It's a learning journey for us, trying to put Baha'u'llah's teaching of equality into, into reality in all sorts of community. In this process, we hope to bring about a glimpse of a civilization that has both material and spiritual qualities. Material civilization is like a lamp. It's beautiful, it's a glass lamp, but without the light of the spirit within it, then that lamp doesn't realize its purpose. To be a civilization of the future, we need both the material and the spiritual, and both the qualities that men and women 
has to bring to advance this civilization. The equality of men and women is a facet of human reality and not just a condition to be achieved for the common good. That which makes human beings human, their inherent dignity and nobility, is neither male nor female. The search for meaning, for purpose, for community, the capacity to love, to create, to persevere, has no gender. Such an assertion has profound implications for the organization of every aspect of human society. Since 1995, much has been learned about the enabling conditions that foster gender equality. Whatever setbacks and obstacles may appear over the next 25 years, the awakening of the majority of the peoples of the world to the truth that women and men are equal will never be lost.